guess it really is just us, just us monkeys. <laughs> Jewel, 
So we have may have some people, pilgrims or tourists or somewhere in between uh, coming to uh, you know, so I, they can come through. I mean, why not? It happens. 
it's better that we let people see what we do than we let people imagine what they might think we do. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> So continuing from where we left off at lunchtime yesterday, yesterday afternoon being the Q&A, and remembering that, as I said yesterday morning, this is not or organized. This is just a list of whatever occurred to me in the middle of the night, in the middle of meditation sessions. And we were talking uh, about um, the, our understanding of the Sangha, what we would call the ordinary Sangha, not the, not the uh, Arya Sangha of uh, Bodhisattvas and Arhats, but the, the women and men, and to some extent children, who make up uh, our uh, Buddhist, worldwide Buddhist uh, community. And how we have to understand that um, every Buddhist institution is or should be a spiritual hospital. And hospital, the word hospital uh, is related, of course, to hospitality, which means that our first um, responsibility uh, as um, Buddhists uh, who, you know, sometimes or frequently or anywhere in between go to Dharma centers is to welcome to be welcoming. And that brings us to the next uh, thing that I wrote down, which is the, the idea of inclusiveness. We are not um, an elite Sangha, by which I mean that regardless of our degree of training personally, regardless of our degree of experience or realization, we are not trying to become members of an elite or exclusive group. As Bharti Rinpoche made very, very clear in many talks he gave in this center or seat, um, it, it is meant to be a welcoming place. Now this of course has been uh, compromised as it has been in every institution throughout the world by the pandemic. We have had to close down. We have had to create uh, conditions, prerequisites for entering the place, you know, some having your temperature checked in the parking lot and so on. But that's in order to protect everyone, including visitors. That is not exclusivity. We need to be, um, and this, I'll connect this with acceptance, unless I lose track, but we need to be, remember that our first duty when we are living in the center, coming to the center, is our responsibility to others. Others includes our, our teachers, Lama Trapto and so forth, but it also includes our Dharma brothers and sisters, and people who just walk in off the street, provided that that's happening. You know, if and when that happens again, then we need to be welcoming. We've never made uh, our ceremonies, other than certain empowerments um, and certain teachings, we've never made uh, our ceremonies restricted. We've never asked for certificates of initiation at the door. Our only restrictions on entry to this place have always been uh, based entirely upon issues of public health. And we have to do that. We have to be smart. We can't, we can't be naive and think that the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha will, will keep us safe from COVID. But aside from issues of public health, openness goes back to the beginning of Buddhism. In India, Vajrayana practices may have been uh, held secretly, but we're not actually doing anything here that really needs to be uh, concealed uh, or hidden. And it's so it's 
our openness, our being welcoming, is kind of our first uh, duty. So if somebody walks in, in the middle of a ceremony, you make sure they have the books. And people do. People are very good. I'm not saying this to uh, criticize. I'm actually saying this to praise. The fact that, you know, when somebody walks in, uh, they're given the books. If somebody gets lost because they're new, um, then somebody will show them. If somebody gets lost in the middle of a complicated puja, even though they've been been around for 20 years, somebody will still will still show them. And I've been that person, as I said, uh, as I said yesterday. I can't remember what was the morning or the afternoon, because I never got to go to the the last day of Yamandaka. When I started going, I was always the one getting lost, and it was very humiliating for me. It was very good for me actually, <laughs> until Debbie took care of it by creating these this you know really user-friendly, even the Tibetan only, she made like super user-friendly at, at Rinpoche's express uh, request. Now, the reason I mention this in the context of our, our broad topic of acceptance is this does require acceptance in the sense that it does require a sacrifice because a lot of times, I, and again, I can only speak for myself, when I'm in a puja, or in a teaching, I can start to become very selfish. I want to do the meditations. I want to say all the things. I don't want to miss it. That's kind of what it is. I don't want to miss anything. It becomes kind of like, I don't know, some of you were too young to remember this, but there was a time when you could only watch television shows at a certain time, you know? And in those days, um, we had electricity. We, you know, we wouldn't have had television, um, but we didn't have computers. And television was a, a big, big box with a very small screen. And um, you, you could only watch whatever it was um, when it was on. This lasted until the, I would say at least the 1980s. And so people would say things like, well, I can't do that. My show is coming on or my show is on or don't bother me now. My show is on. And usually because of that, most people devoted themselves to about one show a week. Um, I remember uh, my, my brother who passed away, not the one who died years ago, but the one who died uh, more recently. Um, he was a oddly, uh, if you knew him, a devotee of Star Trek The Next Generation mm -hmm. in the 1980s. And come hell or high water, he was going to watch that. I don't know what night it was on, but I was visiting him one time and I was astonished because it wasn't, I just couldn't fit my brother with that particular show. Um, but that was it. Now my show's my show's on, and you just disappear. Would it? No matter what was going, could be a dinner party, could be, you know, anything. His show was on, and that was one hour a week. And um, we become a little bit like that. I'm not criticizing that in the you know in the old days. You know, you you couldn't even tape things. Well, maybe they were starting to do that, but anyway. Um, we become like that in our pujas. Oh, my pujas, don't bother me now. You know, I don't want to deal with this. Well, if you don't want to deal with other people's needs, don't come to a Dharma Center. Tibetan monasteries, uh, whether they are lay monasteries, um, you know, what they call Ngapa Gumba, you know, monasteries of, of, of Tantrikas or Ngapas, uh, or the more common monastic monasteries are busy, noisy places. During the day, you will have, regardless of what ceremony is going on, you will have the local lay community storming through because it's also their, their church and their community center. It really is. Elderly Tibetans, um, especially old, older women, but also older men, will spend their whole day 
if they if they have no work to do, no grandchildren that they have or great grandchildren they have to take care of, they will spend the whole day, every day if they can, if they can get there, around the monastery, circumambulating, spinning prayer wheels, going into the temple, making offerings, butter lamp offerings, water offerings, you name it. Because that's part of what it's for. It, you know, we serve a community. Now it's different in this culture because most people are not Buddhist and most of the Buddhists there are, are not Tibetan Buddhists and most Tibetan Buddhists are you know, not our particular little niche, but we do have a community and we do serve that community. When we do these pujas, these yearly pujas, we're doing them for the community. We get spiritual benefit, of course, but we're not doing it for ourselves. If we we're doing it for ourselves, we'd go into retreat. We're doing it for the world, we're doing it for the town, we're doing it for the community. And so we always have to remember that we're, um, even if we're in the middle of puja, we have to be, be ready uh, to meet uh, others' needs. Now, there are obvious times, you know, where it's just not possible. Like, for example, if, if Davis is actively chipping and, you know, since some of our bits with that have that have stuff carried out are, are are torturously short, you know he has to walk around very fast and go from one place to another, and then he's got to have you helping him or somebody else helping him and volunteers up the wazoo and everybody just milling about. So it's not you know I mean I wouldn't particularly go up to Davis and start bothering him about about extraneous random matters while he's chipping the puja. <laughs> but at the same time, the whole fact that he's chipping the puja is an act of service. He is learning skills, definitely, by doing it, but he's also not getting to sit there and chant. You know, and I'm sure if you asked, I mean, he would probably say he's happy doing what he's doing, but I'm sure one day he would like to be able to sit through a puja. You know, I'm so selfish that I even like it when I don't have any instruments, not to, you know. Um, there was a point during Rinpoche's 49 days when I hurt my back and I couldn't drum. I had a great time. I didn't have to drum. I didn't have to do anything. I could just do the practice as best I could. And because um, I'm, I'm lazy and I'm selfish. I mean, I am. This is not, I'm not being falsely modest here. You know, I think everyone in the room knows me well enough to say that I'm selfish. And I, those of you, most of you know I'm lazy, but I am. So, but I drum because it's somebody has to do it. Davis Chippens, because somebody has to do it. People come here, you know, a lot of people come here and they'll bring flowers. I mean... We have a Sangha member who has been coming here to serve when um, she's so physically injured that she can't remain uh, for pujas, and yet she'll still bring the flowers. You know, That's who we need to be. We all need to be like that, because that's part of who Barter Rinpoche was. So that takes some acceptance. OK, now we get to the stuff that Davis wants to hear. <laughs> this is Davis, by the way. Um, and uh, I will try not to call on others of you by name, but but I am Davis is the guy. You know, he's the he's the uh, he's the example, the punching bag, the the archetype, whatever. So um, one of the things that um, is hard for us to accept, um, especially given uh, our generation. I mean, there, you know, there, I would say there are, there are two generations in this room, um, but what they both have in common is some degree of political correctness. And um, 
Epsilon. And um, so, and th and this is this is something that is hard um, for people in our culture to deal with, and that is the issue of Samaya. Now, part of the problem is is that um, it can be uh, distorted. You know, it it, it can be. And uh, part of the problem is that we are um, very uh, sort of libertarian in our outlook. And I'm not talking about a specific political uh, stance uh, in contemporary American society. I think that um, uh, Europeans and, and ethnic Europeans um, since the uh, what we call since the Protestant Reformation, have a strong libertarian bent, and I think that um, of course the the uh, since the American War of Independence, I think that the uh, we've become in this country uh, overtly anti-monarchical, although we're kind of inconsistent about it because. Americans, you know, I, of course, I was born in Canada, and so I grew up a sort of a tacit monarchist. And um, and then when I moved to this country and became a citizen, you know, I promised to to uh, defend the the Constitution of the United States. When you take the oath to become a citizen, you take most of the oath that presidents take. I was shocked when I realized that you don't promise to serve as president of the United States to the best of your Ability, but you do promise to defend the Constitution from enemies, foreign and domestic. You know, I didn't know this until I watched some presidential inaugurations and realized that nine tenths of what they say I had to say. You know, and um, the, which is quite something if you think about it. Um, but so we have this basic libertarian bent. Let's say we may not consider ourselves libertarian, but we don't like to be told what to do. We really don't like to be told what to do. One could argue that nobody likes uh, being told what to do. Um, Kenshin Trungpa she once said to me that the, the problem with being too explicit about Samaya is that if you tell people to do something, they immediately won't want to do it. And that's certainly true of me. I mean, I do the things I do because I want to do them, not because anyone has told me to do them. And in fact, the less you tell me to do, the more I'm likely to do. But we have problems with more than that. We have uh, problems with the whole concept of um, allegiance. In spite of the fact that as a country, we are the most uh, fanatically uh, allegiant, I think, uh, in our uh, political life. But I'm, I'm going to try to steer away from that. Sorry. Um, so I think we need to look at the issue of what Samaya is, uh, what Samaya isn't, and how we can um, learn to uh, accept it. Now, I know that I'm preaching to the choir in this room, but I think that there are many people listening elsewhere who may have active uh, concerns about this. The word Samaya uh, in Sanskrit and apparently also in, in Hindi um, basically refers to a contract or agreement. And it, whether or not it's used nowadays, um, at some point it, it has been used, even in terms of a business contract or a rental contract and so on. Now, the nature of a contract is that both signers undertake certain responsibilities. So the first thing we need to understand about Samaya is it's not that the guru can do whatever they want and the disciple has to do whatever the guru says. 
In fact, the Guru Samayas are far more stringent than those of the uh, disciple. But before we get to the issue of of the the you know the the, the, the rules and regulations or the or the the stipulations of the contract, we need to talk about what is the bond. Because sometimes samaya is translated as a bond. And it's a bond between a student and their teacher. What is the nature of the bond? For example, I uh, rent where I live. And so every year I sign a lease. And in that lease, it talks about uh, things that I must do, things that I mustn't do and things the landlord can do, things the landlord cannot do, things the landlord must do, things the landlord mustn't do, and so on. And um, the bond, the basis of the bond is the physical drum. What bonds me to that to that uh, contract, what bonds the landlord to that contract is that I lease this uh, apartment. Well, what is the bond in some in Samaya? A lot of times, uh, especially in the in uh, the West, people think the bond is certain mantras that you must say, certain practices that you must do or that the bond consists of unquestioning obedience, that you must do everything the guru says. And they think that with good reason, because at the end of every empowerment, you recite whatever the principal or leader has commanded, all that I shall do. And you say that in Tibetan. They usually don't translate it because, you know. <laughs> but um, that's what you say. But it means what they have just said. So before that, they'll say, you know, for example, if it's a long life empowerment, they'll say, try to save lives, try not to kill, you know, and things like that. Now, is the bond obedience? No. Obedience may maintain the bond, but the bond itself is not obedience. The bond the essence of Samaya is, as Gautam Ramshi famously said, love. It is the love the teacher bears the students. And the love, stemming from gratitude, the students bear the teacher. And you can't fake love. You can't force so Samaya is not really about forcing anybody to do anything, if I may say so. The teacher's love for the students is based on two things. First of all, if the teacher is qualified, they have developed a, an impartial love and compassion for all beings. But beyond that, they have real affection for the students based on the fact that the students want to learn. They want to get better. We talked yesterday about how Dharma is all about getting better. You know, they love the students the same way that a, a good physician loves their patients. They may not demonstrate any affection, but they care. They care. And love is caring. It's, as, as I said yesterday, the opposite of love is not hatred, it's apathy, not caring, not giving a shit. The students eventually come to love the teacher when they start to gain experience and realization. That's why upon saying goodbye to him, Milarepa said to Gampopa, there will come a day when you will view this old man in an entirely different way from the way you see me today. And that will be the day on which you are qualified 
to accept disciples. You come to love your teacher because of the effect, the beneficial effect that they have on you. So therefore, I would say that in cases, regardless of the formalities of the situation, in cases when there has been no beneficial effect, for whatever reason, when you have not benefited from the relationship and therefore don't feel love for your teacher as a student, I would question whether there is actually any samaya at all. That's a difficult point. A difficult point is our a spin word um, for or diplomatic language for something on which great masters disagree. I think that um, I've read things about this because of course this has come up very much during the Me Too era for obvious reasons. Uh, I've heard, I've read things by masters whom I respect on either side of this question about whether there is Samaya, if there's no better than or not. So I'm not a great master, so I'm just gonna leave it to my betters. But I think the bond, you know, uh, what Garchan Rinpoche is talking about there is the bond is love. And love has to be earned, earned by the teacher, not just by the student. Now, how do we maintain that bond? That's where the technicalities come in. And the technicalities are infinite. They typically say the 100,000, sometimes they'll say 100 million and so on. The purpose of those numbers is to make you realize that you can't possibly keep all of it perfectly. You have to, so what is the real Samaya, as His Eminence Siddharam Shea says, to do your best. Do your best. You know? And if you question, well, am I doing my best or not? And you can't tell within yourself, then go to your primary teacher, you know, not your not your highfalutin teacher who may live in a different country or may have passed into a different realm, but your actual, the person you can talk to. So for members of this community, it would be Lama Tato. And ask them, you know, check out with them. So the acceptance of a Samaya is not so much the acceptance of endless obligations and allowing yourself to be victimized by um, manipulative individuals who place institutions above individual needs. The acceptance of Samaya is the acceptance of the validity of that caring, that love between student and teacher, between master and disciple. The, um, the, the validity of your feeling of gratitude and appreciation and the validity uh, of uh, their caring and their guidance. All right. Now we're getting closer to what Davis wants to hear. Okay, now we come to pure outlook. Now yesterday, um, at one point I was I, I was rather sharp, I think. Um, I won't take it back because I think I was I was right to be sharp uh, in that instance about um, using our practice of pure outlook as a spiritual bypass. You know, uh, where um, you know. We don't deal with situations. We don't deal with our personal responsibilities uh, to others. We simply say, everything is the deity, all sound is mantra, and all thought is the display of primordially pure wisdom. I'm not imitating any one particular person. I'm kind of imitating my own, <laughs> my own. <laughs> Remember the whole inner child thing in the 80s? <laughs> Everyone was talking about their inner child. I forget who it was, but somebody I know, definitely a Canadian, because this is Canadian and British humor. 
<laughs> when he heard about the whole, uh, and this is not politically correct, but uh, <laughs> when he heard about the whole inner child thing, he said, my inner child needs a good slap upside the head. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's not politically um, You know, the, it sounds good, the notion that everything is a deity. And we, that is the view. That's part of the view, that everything is a deity. And, um, you know, Zong Zetchenzi Rinpoche famously wrote that in um, his book, Medicine is Poison, or Poison is Medicine. Poison is Medicine? I can't remember. <laughs> Medicine is Poison. That's an interesting <laughs> Freudian slip. Um, and we actually say that. Uh, maybe just the Chippen says it. I can't remember. At some point in the Tsok, in the Guru Rumshe Tsok, is it the Chippen that says it? Yeah. yeah, okay. So we don't say it. Davis says it. <laughs> so every, every month, Davis tells us as a formal announcement of the nature of the Tsok, everything is a deity. We say Rangjin, you know, everything is of the nature of deities. In English, that distances us. It becomes a, a concept, you know. Um, that's why I think it's more powerful, instead of saying the mind's nature, to say mind itself, mind per se. Because you see, the mind's nature, the nature of something is a concept. It's an abstraction, you know. Good. And so I think we have to be, be cautious with that. So I would put it the way Zong Tsai Chen Rinpoche famously did in his most recent published book, everything is a deity. And he quoted the Buddha in his form of Vajradhara saying the Vajradhara, which is correct. It's actually a the, it's more of a title than a name, the Vajra holder. The Vajradhara said everything is a deity. We have to, again, return to that dual focus that we looked at yesterday with the sky and the flower, having a view as high as the sky and um, uh, an attention to uh, our choices as fine uh, as flower. Because while we uh, may come to believe that everything is a deity, and even that is not necessarily easy. Books have been written in Tibetan explaining the logic uh, behind uh, that view. Most famously, Rongzong Pandita's um, Establishing Appearances as Divine, uh, which is, that's the English title. Uh, you, can, you can get it. Uh, you can actually get it online, I think, for free. I think it's now... I don't think that's pirated. I think it's actually the it's been released by the by the author and publisher. Uh, but that's a good thing if you're practicing uh, the Mahayoga generation stage, like the Guru Rumshe practice or Yamantaka or Vajrasattva or Vajrakilaya or Vajrayogini as your principal practice, uh, it would be a good idea uh, to read that book. The um, In any case, whether we come to uh, believe that through a logical argument, uh, as Rongzong Pandita uh, gives us the uh, opportunity to, and by the way, His Eminence Shechen Jatsa Purpache is going to be giving the reading transmissions for the complete works of Rongzong Pandita uh, as a, a webinar, as a Zoom uh, loan. Um, soon, I don't know when, um, but I've seen it mentioned uh, on, on Facebook, and you have to register. And there's limited capacity for a number of participants for some reason, so if you wanted to uh, receive that, it would be excellent and, and register for it soon. In any case, um, whether we come to believe that as a matter of a logical conclusion um, or um, as a matter of, of faith, 
once we um, believe it, we also have to accept the fact that, uh, first of all, we don't really know what it means. At any point, we have an idea of what it means, but that idea is necessarily primitive and will be superseded. If we continue to practice and to progress, uh, it will be superseded eventually by a more refined idea, which in turn will be superseded uh, and so on. And the other thing and equally important thing is we're not there yet. Well, at least I'm not there yet. I actually don't know whether anyone else is there yet, which is the whole point. I'm not there yet. I don't actually fully experience. Sometimes I don't even partially experience myself and others as a deity or deities. When I get upset, as we talked about yesterday, uh, based on Sally's question, when the caffeine war runs out, um, I don't experience uh, any kind of uh, pure reality. I experience, uh, you know, fairly uh, dreary reality. So we're at the stage where that is uh, something like a goal, something we would like to, we want to uh, achieve, something we want uh, to come to realize. And that makes acceptance of this pure outlook uh, challenging. Accepting the Vajrayana view, accepting that water is not water, it is the female Buddha Mamaki, that earth is not earth, it is the female Buddha Buddha Lochana, that air is actually Samayatara, that fire is Pandaravasini, that space itself is Vajradhati Ishvari. Accepting that, even remembering the names, is challenging. Accepting that my body and all the forms I experience are the Buddha Vairochana, that my consciousnesses and those of others are the Buddha Akshobhya, that my feelings, mental and physical, are the Buddha Ratna Sambhava, that my perceptions are the Buddha Amitabha, and that my uh, mental formations and other formations are the Buddha Amoga Siddhi. That is challenging. It's easy to recite. It's easy to learn. We have to understand it, but do I really accept it? To what degree do I accept it? And, you know, in a sense, we can paraphrase Jetson Milarepa's statement about karma. People don't really believe in karma or they would live like me. I think we can say the same thing about these Vajrayana principles. Um, I think that if we really accepted them, fully accepted them, uh, we would lead our lives at least slightly differently. So there is a need for some kind of cushion uh, mumbledo. Cushion. It, there are lots of cushions if you'd like to uh, use a cushion. Um, I think we need to actually um, be realistic about um, you know where we are and where we aren't. And not to discourage us, not to belittle us, and not to in any way disparage our efforts thus far on the path. But I think we really need to um, not um, turn this into some kind of spiritual bypass. And I think that the spiritual bypass really starts with pretending that we are not who we are. I think that, for example, and I'm, as I said yesterday, this is something which I am, to which I am prone. I think I'd rather stay away from the word guilty because I think that's a very loaded word. But um, 
because it's much easier to recite words in our head. It's much easier to say Vajradhara said everything is a deity. And for the second I'm saying that until that thought vanishes and the next thought arises, which could be what's for lunch, it could be, you know, I'm thirsty, it could be anything. Uh, until that next thought arises, I may actually be considering the idea of everything being a deity. But it takes work. Now, to join this issue of acceptance with the preceding one of Samaya, it's important to remember that while we differentiate in uh, isolating the concepts, you know, we have the concept of Samaya as obligation or something, and then we have the concept of practice as what we do. Actually, it's all the same thing. The cultivation of pure outlook, pure view, sacred outlook, whatever you want to call it, formal practice that we do on our own or in groups, and what we call our, our bond, our samaya. These are all one thing. It's all together. There's a distinction, of course, at our level between meditation and post-meditation. A distinction we want to gradually wear through. But um, fundamentally, if we're uh, serious about this, it's all fund practice and samaya and pure outlook uh, are all different. We could say different aspects of the same thing. The next thing that we have to, um, and again, it's next just means I thought of it next, um, that we have to accept is the need for kindness. We have to, um, it's very easy for us to uh, say, this is not my job. This is my job. This is not my job. And I'm not only talking about in, when working in a Dharma center, uh, but at any point in our lives. And sometimes, uh, for the sake of, of proper boundaries, we in do indeed need to say that. This is not my job. You're asking me to do something that is not my job, for which I am not being paid, and so on. In professional and career life, of course, that's, that's appropriate. But even when we um, defend our boundaries, protect our boundaries, well, we need to do so as much as possible with kindness. I find myself um, acting unkindly, even to people I care about. You know, there are uh, constant ways um, to be uh, un passively unkind, to, um, for example, when, when people need to need your attention, you can set up boundaries, you can defend your boundaries, but if you care about the person, at some point you're going to try to do something to help them. Whether it's the help they ask for, or if you differ with their opinion, the help that you think they need, you're going to do something. And the point is the motivation of kindness. And in the Dharma centers, which is obviously where I'm headed with this, especially um, small Dharma centers, this can become an issue. Because the smaller the group, broadly speaking, there are exceptions to this in extreme cases, but the smaller the group, the larger individual personalities um, take uh, hold sway. And um, we may not be mental patients, although I think I qualify, but we're certainly spiritual patients. And so we should not expect, I mean, if you're in a mental hospital, you don't expect everyone around you to be perfect, or, or at least I would hope not. I haven't, I haven't spent time in one yet. Um, there's still time. But in, a, but in a spiritual hospital, we have to have that same attitude of not being judgmental. 
not having expectations. And we, it, the responsibility is always ours as an individual. Each one of us has the responsibility to be nice, to be kind, even when the other person isn't. And the reason why we always have that responsibility and why we have to accept that responsibility unless we're going to live like Milarepa. Milarepa didn't have to be kind to anyone. He was consummately kind until he took disciples. But when it was just him and the, and the, the you know, random wild animals, he was never unkind, but he didn't have to actually exercise kindness until he took disciples. But we do, because that's not our lifestyle. We're a socially engaged, it, you know, it may not feel, attending a Dharma Center may not feel like a, a high level of social engagement, but it actually is in a certain way, because we're interacting with people. And um, we have to accept that it is our responsibility in other words, it is my responsibility to be kind to everyone else. And whoever you are, you are me to you. In other words, you don't think of yourself as you, you think of yourself as me. So therefore, each of us is the one responsible to be kind to all the them or all the yous or whatever. And the reason for this is very simple. It's uh, what I uh, uh, quoted Trung Rinpoche saying yesterday, that um, fights are not started by one person getting angry. They're started by a second person reacting to that anger uh, with anger. Now, I'm not saying this is true on international levels. That's a whole different dynamic. But when it's two people, two people in a, in a marriage, two people uh, working together in a Dharma center, whatever it is, once you have two people, each of them has the responsibility to the other to be kind. And if one of you, one of us, can't maintain that responsibility, the other one of us has all of the responsibility and has to fulfill it. It's not the case that if I'm in an interaction with someone and they are unkind to me, that that absolves me of the responsibility to be kind to them. It's quite the opposite. If someone else is unkind to me, I mean, I'm allowed to protect myself and protect third parties, but if we're just talking about basic you know, behavior, if someone else is unkind to me, I not only have the responsibility I had going into the interaction to be kind to them, I have undertaken by not walking away, I can walk away, that's a different thing, but I, by not walking away, I have undertaken the moral responsibility that they previously had simply because they are evidently at the moment unable to shoulder that. And we've all been that person. We've all been, and most of us will be again, I know I will be, the person who at the moment, for whatever reason, is unable to be kind. The other person, if they are attempting to practice Dharma, to practice any kind of spirituality, bears the responsibility to temporarily, not always, temporarily make up that deficit, bear the responsibility that we uh, cannot bear. And that is hard to accept because we have this idea of fairness, you know, and we think that karma is fair. Karma is not fair. Karma is tragedy. It's not fair that if I take, take a hammer and smash my thumb with it, I'm going to have a, a sore thumb. That's not fair. It's the way it works. It's not fair or unfair. The whole concept of fair and unfair is predicated upon theism. 
predicated upon the idea of a creator God uh, who sets up arbitrary standards of fairness and justice. The whole notion of justice beyond the, the criminal justice system is it has no meaning. You know, there's nothing just about someone doing something bad and suffering as a result. It's the way it works, but it's it's not it's not a good thing. When we use the word just, it implies that um, oh, it's good. I feel good. They're suffering as a result of their sins. You're not supposed to feel good about that. That's not compassion. You know, it's 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 tragedy compounding tragedy. It's the way the, the universe appears to work, but it's not. It, 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 we can't think of it as, as a, a wonderful thing. Now, there is injustice, of course, but that's a concept based upon, you know, our relative concept of justice. So we need to accept the unfairness of having to be the good guy, the good person even when someone else is not. And that's not easy. But if we mean this Mahayana stuff, if we mean this Vajrayana Samaya stuff, uh, we have to do it. We have no choice. We can leave. You know, we don't have to be here. The doors are maybe locked for coming in, but they're not locked to keep you from going out. Now we come to accountability. Everyone is accountable for what we say and do. But we cannot use the principle of accountability as a weapon. As the previous Kalurumbache uh, uh, wrote in a, a Tatsik, uh, it was kind of like a Tatsik kind of means a, a, a statement of, of rules, but it was it was basically advice and uh, strongly given advice for going into retreat and for people who do retreat, and it was also for uh, lamas coming out of retreat, how to teach, how to be in a Dharma center, and so on. And um, what he said was, the principle of accountability is primarily to be imposed upon oneself. In other words, we must always hold ourselves accountable for our actions, which means I don't get to rationalize why I have said and done many of the foolish things that I have said and done. I don't get to say this was uh, because Vajrayana practice brings up the clashes as it brings up wisdom and therefore I was experiencing the co-emergence of places and wisdom and therefore expressed that as such and such misbehavior. I don't get to say that. But I also don't get to say that that's untrue of somebody else because I don't know. I can hold them accountable for their effect on me. If I need to protect a third party, from a member of the Sangha, including a teacher, I can hold that member of the Sangha or teacher accountable insofar as I need to, to protect that third party. But I must never think that I really know what's going on with them, because I don't. You know, I cannot tell. I mean, we, we've developed broad stroke standards for you know, determining who's a Buddha and who's a sentient being. But I can't tell. You know, the the the, the stories about uh, the Bodhisattva Manjushri that no one has ever read, it seems, uh, 
um, uh, really make that point. You just can't tell. You know, I imagine a Buddha would have such and such visible attributes, but I don't know. His Holiness the Jaon Kamapa teaching at the Kaju Manlam in whatever year was the big Guru Ramsha year with the, the Guru Ramsha dance. It was that year. Could have been 2013, 14, 15, I don't know. I don't think it was 2015, but I can't remember years. Um, teaching at the, the, the Kaju Manlam, I think it was that year. Um, he talked about, you know, how we think about the Buddha and how we think about teachers of the past. And, you know, we, we make these beautiful statues of the Buddha Shakyamuni. We talk about the six foot halo and the, the Ushnisha that no one ever saw because any to any observer, he was always a little bit taller. So if an ant looked at the Buddha, he was slightly bigger than an ant. If a dinosaur had seen the Buddha, he would have been slightly bigger than that dinosaur. That's what we're told. And he said, we read all that stuff. And his always didn't say that's not true. I don't want to, I don't want to mis, misquote him. So don't say that Yeshe Jansu said that his holiness said the sutra was not true. I never said that. He never said that in my hearing. Um, but he said that if we saw the Buddha, we would just see an Indian guy. And he brought up that point because he said, you know, we often think, oh, in those days they had real gurus, they had great gurus, the Buddha was so magnificent. You know, Talopa, Naropa, Morpa, they must have glowed. And he said, you know, had you seen Talopa and Naropa, you would have run the other way, especially Talopa, you know, or you would have ignored him with contempt the way people walk along the streets of Manhattan and sneer at homeless people. Not just Manhattan, everywhere. But anything sounds fancy if you say Manhattan. Um, he said that, you know, and then we look at our current gurus and we think, Man, it's kind of ordinary, you know. Um, you know, and, and of course, the more time we spend with them, the more ordinary they seem to us because we're only capable of experiencing ordinary. You know, and um, he said that, that, that that's a problem. You know, we, we, we have more devotion for statues of those we never met than for um, our, you know, our present day uh, the teachers. So, uh, where was I going with that? Where did I come from? Accountability. So, um, I'm sorry, I got kind of lost. So we need to be careful in assuming that we know where, where someone uh, is, is at. You know, and this is true not only of, of spiritual teachers, not only of fellow Sangha members, but true of everyone. You know the old saying, before you criticize someone, walk a mile in their shoes? Everyone knows that saying, right? Mm -hmm. That's only half the saying. The second half is because then you'll be a mile away and you'll have their shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's, I like that joke. Um, now, accountability. Oh, there's lots. I can even start talking this afternoon. Well, except it's only 11, 13. It's really hard to listen to this stuff in one language that doesn't stop, right? Because um, you don't get a break. You don't get to like space out for half the time. We were talking yesterday about how, you know, except for um, avid students of Tibetan and the, the, the poor schmuck who's translating, um, everybody else, the teaching Lama and the audience gets to space out half the time, which is actually nice. I mean, it's actually, that's actually okay. And you don't get to do that. It's as bad as school. 
You know, when I've um, attended the teachings mm -hmm. translated by somebody else, because I understand both Tibetan and English fairly well, um, and I mean fairly well in both cases, because sometimes I don't understand English. I get, I get things confused and they have to be explained to me. Um, like sometimes I'll watch a movie uh, with another person and they'll be reacting to something and I'm not just, just not getting it. And nowadays we can stop the movie and ask, okay, what is going on? Because I have no idea. That happens. It's not like one time thing that happens frequently, which indicates a certain je ne sais quoi about my brain. Um, Where were we? Where was I? Acceptance. Acceptance. Well, acceptance is the whole thing. Accountability. Yeah, you know, we were still on accountability. Um, we finished with accountability. Where was I going with the whole thing about movies and not understanding? And, well, basically, we don't know what's going on with anybody else. We do need um, accountability. Oh, I know, because I, I got off about the whole thing of how hard it is to listen for two hours straight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to fix that. We're eventually going to going to scale it down to an hour and a half uh, when it's a teaching in one language. Uh, two hours is fine when it's like Lama Tato teaching with, you know, him te talking half the time, me talking half the time. But when it's just one of us up here, um, you know, no comedy specials, I've noticed, seem to last more than an hour. They used to last an hour and a half, but now all the Netflix comedy specials are pretty much pretty much down to, to uh, an hour. And that's about as long as I can listen to one stand-up comedian, even, even uh, the best of them. Because anybody's thing uh, gets old after about an hour, which is uh, happening right now. Accountability brings us to boundaries. And the topic of boundaries, acceptance of boundaries, is particularly interesting to me because I have really poor boundaries. There are several reasons for this in my case. I want to be liked. I always want to be the good guy. And this was a problem uh, in my parenting. Um, I was uh, a somewhat, uh, I would say, a somewhat spoiled. Not that she is spoiled, she's not spoiled, but I kind of spoiled uh, my child a bit. Or I didn't provide, put it this way, I didn't provide firm enough boundaries that she felt safe. That's the way she puts it. Because boundaries not only um, teach a child uh, restraint and proper conduct, they also make them feel safe. But I'm too attached to being liked. I'm too attached to being the good guy. And one of the problems that makes, and I'm talking about this because I want to talk about boundaries in general. Um, one of the problems that makes is that you end up becoming sneaky. If you don't have good boundaries, you never want to say no to anyone you end up practicing avoidance. And avoidance may start as avoiding difficult confrontations, avoiding difficult situations, but eventually, or even just by that sometimes, you're actually avoiding fulfilling your own responsibilities. Whether it's, a, it's as a parent or in more germane here um, as a member uh, of a practicing community. Now, setting up good boundaries is tricky because it's hard for, for us, uh, hard for, for me, I should say, it may not be hard for anyone else. It's hard for me to clearly see the line between a good, firm boundary and uh, being harsh. I don't have 
the particular skill set I still don't have to this day. And since I'm 62, I'm not expecting to develop that skill set in this life. Maybe as a doddering old man, oh, I'm going to set up a bound reader. But um, I don't have the skill set it takes to be firm without being a jerk. I've never mastered that um, that's, that skill set. Some people are really, really good at that. I, I admire people and I know people who can um, set up firm boundaries without being officious. As soon as I try to set up a boundary, I immediately stray into officiousness. I read this word officious yesterday in a book I'm reading. And now that I read on, on my uh, phone, of course, you can look up every word. And I'm learning how many words I never knew the meaning of that I've been using all my life anyway. Because you remember when dictionaries were heavy and you didn't want to carry it all the time because you had so many others. Well, you, you two don't remember, don't nod. <laughs> don't, 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 don't nod as though you know what it's like to have heavy bags full of school books, each, each one of which weighs 35, you remember. Yeah, that side of the room gets to remember. You know, and this, these two, they, they don't get to it. They don't, they, they, you have no idea. You know, the school, our school bags were so heavy that, and this is not an exaggeration, that I developed a permanent, like a, a, a Quasimodo posture from always carrying it on my left shoulder because I'm left handed. And, you know, so you're on the bus, you usually have to stand on the bus, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and this goes on year after year after and year. If you did two straps, you were not cool. No, you, you couldn't do two. If you straps. did two straps, they would they would go into your bag and 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 uh, <laughs> mess with right. mess with your stuff. No, they they go into your bag and mess with your stuff. It wasn't about being cool. It was about safety. I mean, no, I mean you had to have the bag free so you could swing it at people. <laughs> you know, because it was it was a well. It, it goes by the neighborhood, I think. Well, I'm <laughs> All right, now we're now we're now we're now we're now we're now we're doing yeah, yeah. Anyway, so um, so because of that, I you know we avoided the use of the dictionary, and um, so there, if you could kind of figure out by context what a word meant, um, you know, you would you would kind of fake it. So what I've realized, um, and this is a, a, a heavy admission for a, an interpreter, uh, is that um, a lot of my English is fake or imprecise. I'm constantly finding in conversations with friends that their vocabulary, and this is true of at least two people in the room at the moment, um, their vocabulary is far better no, not you. <laughs> Far better in English than mine. Yeah, you. <laughs> you know, and uh, but now I look words up. So I looked up the word officious, and I saw uh, that it means to be overbearingly authoritarian in a in or overbearing in your demonstration of uh, uh, or active. Uh, demonstration or invocation of authority. So I am not able to set good boundaries without becoming officious. It's as though the boundary wall is a razor blade or razor blade thin. And I can either fall on this side of it where there's no boundary at all or the, uh, the other side of it where I'm officious. So establishing boundaries, accepting boundaries, interests me because it's so hard for me. I have trouble accepting other people's boundaries. You know, I'm constantly misreading them and, and misreading social cues and so on. And I have trouble establishing my own, which is a sign to me, like when you're uh, irritated, like when I'm irritated by another person and know that that means that whatever 
Klesha, I'm projecting on them whether they have it or not. I definitely suffer from it predominantly. It's a clear sign to me that I need that boundaries are very, very important uh, for me. And especially boundaries uh, need to be um, clear and clearly expressed. Now, there's an issue sometimes in Dharma centers and in other uh, groups about what constitutes clear expression uh, of boundaries. Um, there's a type of therapy called imago uh, therapy, uh, which I did briefly as a form of, of couples therapy, where when each person talks, uh, each of the two clients talks, the other person repeats verbatim what they said, practically verbatim. I hear you saying that when I say this, you feel that, and so on. And people make fun of this. Uh, a, a friend of mine who is a, who is a therapist, and not my therapist, but a, a, is a therapist, called it therapy for slow people, which I thought was rather judgmental. But I think that um, for many of us, we need that level of clarity with our boundaries. I'm not saying we need to, when there's a boundary dispute in a Dharma center, you need to go to an imago therapist and, and repeat everything they each other say. But that level of taking things slowly and making sure you're being clear. Now, this is an issue for me because I'm slow. I'm not dumb, but I'm slow and there's a difference. Um, I can, I can uh, grasp many abstractions, which is usually uh, a measure of, of one type of intelligence, but I'm very, very slow in my thinking and reasoning. I don't think uh, fast. I'm literally slow. That means that if I'm dealing with other people who think much more quickly than I do, and many people do, um, I have to, to sprint at some point to catch up if I can, and often I can. So um, for me, the clarification of boundaries uh, has to be on my side and on the side of anybody I have a boundary dispute with, a painstaking a process. Um, a, uh, for many people, a paralyzingly slow uh, process. But I wonder how many of us would avoid boundary disputes and boundary issues if we slowed everything down, we slowed our communication. Now, obviously, if you're in the middle of active war, you know, you have such and such number of tormas to make in an hour, you know, you don't have time to sit down with people. I'm sorry I'm focusing on Chupa and stuff, but it's, it, you know, you are the target. Um, you don't have time to sit down with people and talk about their emotional needs unless you can do it while making cool tormas and showing them how to make them. Then that fine but that's multitasking which is another thing i can't do so you know, i can't i can't preach what i can't do so well i have to preach what i can't do because if i only preached what i could do i could only talk for about three minutes um but still you know you have to make a mental note to take the time at another time uh, and work it out so don't let boundary issues uh, fester and um, I'm speaking to myself here. I'm speaking to everyone. Um, it means we can't nurse resentments. Twelve step programs say that they um, are filled with resentments. They say that a 12 step program, all you need for a 12 step meeting is a pot of coffee and a bunch of resentments. <laughs> I would say that's equally true of Dharma centers. Not necessarily the coffee, but, but the, the resentments. I think that we come, we're converts, which means we chose this. And we chose a religion. I, 
believe that Buddhism is a religion. I mean, we, we wear funny hats, funny clothes. We put people on thrones. That looks like a religion to me. So I'd say if it, if it walks like a religion, quacks like a religion, it's probably a religion. But, you know, let's call it a difficult point because some eminent masters say it's not. But we come to this religion because we're suffering. Everyone is suffering, we're told, but we come to this religion because at least we know we're suffering and we're looking to get better. And we've heard the message that um, we can't just get rid of suffering, we have to get rid of the cause of suffering and we're still here. So that means that on some level, to some degree, we accept that message. Understanding that we all have that in common we understand that we are all going to have all sorts of issues, boundary issues and other issues. And we're all going, we all come into this full of resentments and we tend to uh, pick more up at a rate faster than we let go uh, of the old ones. And that is also a measure of uh, the health of our practice not how much time we spend doing formal practice, but whether it's working, you know, how much we can let go of resentments. Another thing that um, we need to accept is a long-term vision. I'm not speaking solely of this community and this center or this sangha, but I'm going to use us as an example for the same reason that when I'm talking about individual issues, I use myself as an example. When Bardo Rinpoche created this center and sangha, initially by renting the uh, property on Pinewood Lane, then uh, acquiring this land, breaking the ground, and over uh, many years, hampered by both his health problems and other things, many years building this now complete uh, and beautiful center. He did not create it solely for our current use. He did create it in part for our current use. We shouldn't think that we are just servants of a long-term vision who do not benefit from it. But we need to accept our responsibility to preserve serve and preserve. We need each of us, and it, this is a responsibility, of course, that devolves to some extent on the shoulders of the board and uh, on a, a teaching level of Lama Trotto in particular. But each and every one of us has some responsibility I'm not talking about the responsibility to financially support KPL. I'm not talking about the responsibility to be the person who brings the flowers, be the person who sweeps the shrine, be the person who does one thing, who does the, the recording. You know, these are all ways of, 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 of bearing that responsibility. But we have the responsibility to um, keep this a healthy and vibrant community. To make sure that this spiritual hospital fulfills its function. That people who come here do receive the care for which they have come. People come here, we came here for one reason alone, 
to get better. And we need to respect that. We're all quirky. There is no one of us that is not quirky. And so we can't say, well, you're too quirky to practice Dharma. When we say that, we are not practicing Dharma. Practicing Dharma can be anything from saying one omene pemi hum in your entire lifetime to meditating sporadically all the way up to spending your entire life in strict retreat, which in Tibet was and may still be not a rare thing. Doing a three-year retreat is, I would say, to be optimistic, maybe halfway up the scale between saying one omeni peme home in your whole life and spending your whole life in retreat. I would say doing a three-year retreat or something like that is maybe between 30 and 50%. It's closer to saying one omeni peme home than it is to being a lifelong retreat, I think. I don't mean to discourage anybody, but I mean, I have to be honest. So everyone who walks in that door, whether they've taken the vow of refuge or not, is the moment they walk in that door, a practitioner. Everyone who walks in that door is serious. A lot of times old Dharma hands you know, people who've been around for a long time, people who've, you know, we've been to India, some of us have been to Tibet, not me, but, you know, we have all these sorts of credentials that we have. I've done two, three year retreats, big deal. You know. All of us, or often, we tend to divide people into he's serious, she's serious, he's not serious, she's not serious. They don't really practice. They don't know anything. Oh, we only see them every few months. We don't get to do that. I mean, we get to do it, but it's a shame that we do it. There's no dividing line here. The only dividing line that we recognize is between Buddhas and sentient beings. And that dividing line is ultimately not real either. But from our point of view, it seems real. So we'll accept that as a conditional dividing line. Aside from that, we're all the same. Nobody's better than anybody else. Nobody gets to judge anybody else. Nobody gets to think, I'm a senior student. I've known Rumshay since 1979. I get to, you know, that, that gives me real cred. It doesn't give me anything. The fact that I did a three-year retreat, so what? I did it for myself. Congratulations. You know, it's like somebody goes to the gym. They don't expect me to congratulate them because they go to the gym. It's good that they go to the gym. It's good for them. I mean, if it is, it's good for them, you know. But they're not doing it so that I can say, oh, you went to the gym. <laughs> oh, give me your blessing. You know, I mean, it's like, let's get real, folks. None of us gets to be proud. None of us gets to think we're better than anybody else. It's an interesting thing to return to Samaya for a moment that when you receive an empowerment, you are bound by vow, a vow that we don't keep because it's very hard to keep to view each and every other person who received that empowerment with you as the deity from then onward. Every time you don't think of them as the deity, every time you think of them as, as you know, Davis or Kathy or Nicole, then, you know, you're, um, you're infringing. I don't, I don't want to say breaking, but you're infringing on your Samaya. And the reason for that is the only legitimate reason for me thinking of myself 
as the deity is that I received that empowerment. I don't get to think, because I say so many mantras every day, I get to think of myself as Guru Rinpoche or whoever it is. I'm entitled to, because I say more mantras. I know I say more mantras than she does. I know I say more mantras than he does. You know, I've seen him say mantras. He's so slow. You know, it's like, it, 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 that's not much of an exaggeration, is it? I don't get to think that. I mean, I may think it, but it's, I shouldn't. The only reason I get to think of myself as whatever deity it is, is because I received that empowerment. Well, you received the same empowerment at the same time. So if the only reason I get to call myself Guru Rinpoche or Yamantaka or whoever it is, is equally a reason for calling you Guru Rinpoche or Yamantaka or whoever it is, I don't get to judge you. If I disdain your divinity, I disdain my own divinity. If I disparage you as my yidam, I disparage me as my yidam because we are equal. That's samaya, the samaya between Vatra brothers and sisters. Well, can't go much further with that. So long-term vision uh, means that we have to preserve, in this, in the case of this community, we have to preserve Barter Rinpoche's vision. We have to make the best possible use of Lama Chattop's expertise which is considerable. In certain respects uh, of all the, the teachers I've met, his expertise is unequaled. In certain respects, his knowledge, his skills, because this is a very skill requiring religion. I mean, you gotta be able to like, all the things I can't do, like sand mandalas and stuff like that, my hands shake. Do you know what it would look like if I tried to make a sand mandala? It would be really, really bad. My hands shake so badly that even when my daughter was three and four, we would go to a restaurant and her place, her, her table setting would be immaculate. And mine would look like World War III had just happened. That's why this scares me, the white and the Zen. I've got to be so careful because I, you know, I can, I can spill anything on anything, anytime before I've even know, know I've done it. You know, it's like, so I understand that. How does that, what does that have to do with long-term vision? Um, Oh, skills, right. So we need to uh, make, remember um, that these skills are to be treasured, which means they are to be learned. Anyone who has artistic ability and people with artistic ability do come to these, these places should learn as much of the, the, the artsy crafty part of our tradition as possible, because it needs to be preserved. Whether we will ever in future times become an, a, a Sangha that is preserved entirely by people from this country or not, I don't know. And I don't particularly care because the world is such a fluid place. But we definitely need to use the skills we have for the sake of preservation of this vision. The next thing I wrote down is responsibility to others. And I mean, we've touched upon this in so many contexts that there's really not much more to add, except that fundamentally, 
you know, we can, I guess, sum a lot of this up. Fundamentally, acceptance um, for us who, who are attempting to practice Mahayana, Vajrayana, and Mahayana Buddhism, Vajrayana being a subset of Mahayana, um, we have to be um, take our responsibility to others very seriously. Now, in saying that, I am being uh, hypocritical to um, an extraordinary degree. Because as I've said, and I mean it, I'm selfish. Taking responsibility for others' well-being is very, very hard for me. I can fake it, but what I'm really doing is trying to be the nice guy so people will like me. But um, we have to go beyond that. We have to go beyond wanting to be liked, wanting to be thanked, wanting to be um, talked about in a good way. We have to really care about others for their own sake. And we have to extend that to every single person who walks through these doors. Ideally, we want to extend it to all beings. But the, all, as His Holiness, the Karmapa has said like, many times, we overuse this all beings and stuff because then we generalize. It's very easy to think, do I love all beings? Of course I love all beings. Well, do I love the Uvalde shooter? He's a being. Do I love the person who cuts me off in traffic? You know that, that the corner, is it here? Am I pointing in the right direction? Mm -hmm. The corner there? So the person who is, um, if you're turning, if you're heading south on 9G and uh, turning left uh, onto 199 heading into the village, uh, you have right away. And the other day I was coming from here and the person who was supposed to uh, actually uh, yield didn't yield. I nearly got, I had to actually swerve into oncoming traffic to avoid being, um, having my, my, my car destroyed. And they didn't even stop, followed us. And um, that happens, you know, people do that. At the moment, at that moment, did I love that person? I didn't. It not, not even this. No, no, I didn't love that person at that moment. And, you know, that sounds, well, you, you could say, well, who, who could blame you? But, well, this isn't about blame. This is about getting better. We talked about blame yesterday. Blame is shit. Blame serves no purpose. Don't blame people. Fix stuff. Fix yourself. You know. So that's responsibility to others. The next thing that we might want to look at is gratitude. And again, we've touched on this. But I suppose we have two types of gratitude. There's the gratitude we feel toward those whom we know intentionally helped us. For example, that's the gratitude we might feel toward a spiritual teacher, you know, toward Bartolo, toward Lama Trapta, toward whoever. The gratitude we might also feel that way toward a, a, a physician, or a therapist, or a psychiatrist, or uh, you know, an EMT technician, or a nurse, or a teacher you know, in schools or somebody who helps us, trying to help us. 
And that kind of gratitude is easy. Sometimes we don't even feel that. Um, and I'm, again, I'm speaking of myself. Sometimes we become so jaded and so um, spoiled that we take others caring for us for granted, you know. And while well, it's your job, you know, I'm not that grateful to you for teaching me such and such practice because it's your job. Um, that's not a very healthy uh, attitude that's kind of lacking in appreciation. But harder than that is another type of gratitude, which is the way that we feel when we recognize that somebody who is not trying to help us has either inadvertently or against their malign intentions helped us. And that type of gratitude is spoken of um, a great deal, of course, in the Mahayana mind training uh, teachings, where it says things, for example, in, in the 37 practices of the Bodhisattvas and in the uh, mind training guidebooks and so on, manuals, guidebooks, you know, learn to be grateful to those who seek to harm you because they reveal your, uh, your selfishness or your fixation on a self and all of that, your defensiveness and so on. Um, I think the, the dramatic and radical terms in which uh, this is, uh, is phrased in the mind training teachings can sometimes put us off because it seems like something of which we are incapable. And it also seems um, to smack of self-disparagement or an unhealthy attitude of uh, sacrificing oneself for the good of others that is unhealthy simply because it's unsustainable. If you, um, you know, if you put yourself at risk for the benefit of others continually, eventually your number is going to come up and that will end, at least in this life, your ability to help others. So in a sense, we need to question the dramatic nature of these statements, you know, um, like even if someone were to cut off my head, I'd be grateful uh, to them and so on. I don't know what I'd feel if somebody cut off my head. I'd probably be quite surprised unless I was expecting it. And then I'd probably be crying and freaking out and they'd have to hold me down and stuff. I mean, they used to have to hold me down for shots when I was a kid. Shots are not as bad now. And I don't, I don't think it's me. I think it's, I think the needles have gotten thinner. I think we've, our, our metallurgy has, has developed. I may be wrong, but I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, and they've also gotten, gotten smart. They've got things the other day, I went to the dentist for a filling when they put in the needle. The first thing he went like this with my cheek, which confuses your brain. So you actually didn't, I actually didn't feel that needle going into my gum. It was astonishing, it was so clever. And, uh, but anyway, I think we, we are, especially nowadays with our concern with, um, with uh, the, the sort of um, specious martyrdom and um, virtue signaling, especially, which is a big problem. Um, actually, I need to add that to the list, virtue signaling. That'd be a juicy topic. Um, not something we need to accept, but virtue signaling. I think that there is a way of understanding this, uh, the, the sort of extremely dramatic signaling only has one L. I didn't know that. I spelled it with two L's and my phone corrected me. Uh, it's quite possible. I'm, you know. As computers get better, my spelling gets worse. 
And this was the thing that you remember yesterday morning, there was something that I wanted to say in a certain context and I forgot it and I couldn't remember it. Well, this was, the, this is that thing. And um, it, it's, it fits in this context uh, very, very well. What are we talking about? Responsibility to others? Oh no, gratitude. Well, oh yeah, gratitude toward, toward um, those who, who either don't care or seek to harm us. The, um, the Mahayana mind teachings with their everything bad to me, everything good to others, all victory and profit to others, all loss and defeat to myself, sound, can sound masochistic uh, and certainly um, like um, specious martyrdom. But they serve a purpose and they're, they're uh, it's, it's almost a little bit of hyper hyperbole in the way that they're put. Uh, they're sort of hyperbolic. Well, that's, that's not correct because that it would be used in another context. They're dramatic uh, statements, serve a, a purpose. And um, there's a wonderful analogy for this that uh, Bardo Rinpoche gave uh, while teaching many, many, many years ago at KTD that I, uh, I've treasured ever since. And um, I've joked about it with friends, the analogy, because this is something that the, the, not the application, but the analogy itself is something that I never knew when I was a kid and could really have used um, back then. And when I mentioned it to friends, they laughed because apparently everybody else knew this the whole time. He said that the, 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 the mind training practices are an example of what is called reversal meditation. And reversal meditation is where you dramatically reverse or go against the current of a habit you wish to change in order to end up in the middle. So you don't want the end product to be somebody who is a doormat. That's not the goal. But on the other hand, if you simply say, okay, I'm going to cherish others and myself without having divested yourself of the habit of selfishness, it's not going to be strong enough. And the analogy he used was of a poster. Now I assume there are still posters. Um, I don't, they're not as common, I guess, as, as they used to be. But anyway, when I was a kid, I think my very first poster was, my very first poster was the father of the current prime minister of Canada before the 1968 election. We were, we were all gung-ho. It was like the Obama movement in this country. And so we had big posters of Pierre Elliott Trudeau. And, you know, that was, and that was big, it was a big poster. Um, I had one in my room, I remember. And my second poster was definitely Jimi Hendrix. It was day glow, it was really cool. That was a present from my brother. And then after that, I don't know what, Bruce Lee, maybe something like that. Butch Cassidy and Sunday's kid, I don't, I don't remember. I had all those at different times. But anyway, the thing that I didn't know <laughs> about posters, and nobody told me, a poster comes wrapped up um, around a cardboard uh, tube uh, and held fast by some kind of cellophane. And when you um, remove the cellophane and you um, uncurl uh, or unroll the poster, um, what I always did was, what I want in the end was a poster that will remain flat on the wall. Right? But I would always try to weigh the poster down at the four corners with heavy things. In those days, volumes of Encyclopedia Britannica. In, in, in those far gone times, encyclopedias were big, heavy things. You had to buy a special bookcase for them. Not everybody had them. I mean, it was like a big expense. And um, we had a copy of Encyclopedia Britannica, I remember. 
uh, in the, the 60s. And um, those, each volume was uh, very heavy. So I would stretch the poster out on a table and um, hold it flat. And I believed that the longer it lay flat, the less likely it was to crawl back up when I put it on the wall. So I would let it lay flat for a long time. And then um, I would, when I became impatient or whatever, I would remove the uh, books, the volumes of the encyclopedia and uh, stick the poster to the wall with, with tape. And no matter how I did it, it would always curl back up. If the tape wasn't strong enough, it would kind of buckle and curl in the middle. Usually the tape would, because it was quite humid where I lived in Montreal at that time. Um, it would, the, the, one or other of the, usually the bottom tapes would dislodge and the whole thing would sort of gradually return to its wanted state. The, the analogy that Bart Urmshe gave was you can actually make that poster flat very, very quickly. No matter how long it has been rolled up in one direction, if you simply roll it up in the other direction, so if the image is on the outside, you roll it up with the image on the inside, for a very short time, that will flatten the poster and it doesn't take long. You can just roll the poster up and then immediately uh, unroll it, stick it on the wall and it'll lie flat. When I described this um, analogy, which I found astounding and informative, not only as an analogy, but as a practical matter, um, I, uh, when I informed, when I communicated it with certain friends, uh, they laughed and said, well, everybody, we've always known that since the early 60s. And, but nobody ever told me, and I wasn't clever enough to figure it out for myself. I had to learn this in, in my 40s uh, from Barter Rinpoche. And, um, but that's the way Mahayana mind training works. In order to counteract um, an aeons long we say eons in this country, eons long, uh, I guess I, they say eons everywhere, eons long <laughs> habit of selfishness. We briefly, comparatively briefly, you know, this lifetime is brief. We briefly cultivate the opposite habit, the habit of unselfishness or of altruism or putting others first. And it's not that we want a poster with the image curled up on the inside. It's just that that's the quickest way to get the poster to lie flat. So that is why the, in the Mahayana, we're taught to be especially grateful uh, to those who, who, although they seek to harm us, actually, uh, cause us to lose track of selfishness. We're two minutes over time, so I'll stop for this morning. We'll conclude with the dedication. I think we can conclude with a brief dedication this morning, and then we'll do the whole one uh, in the afternoon. Sanam de ye Thank you.